Thank you, Sister Nancy. It's always so wonderful to be in your presence. How are we doing, folks? We just had lunch. Don't lie to me. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I, uh, I totally honor and respect the afternoon sleepies that come after a very full and wonderful meal. So uh, I hope that we're able to stick together here and, uh, and have a great hour. It's a, it's a wonderful blessing to be with you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, the work that you're doing is just so very impactful, and I, and I, and I know that you know that. And as, as a person who um, spoke with vocation directors while I was discerning my own vocation, um, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen and to accompany young people along the way. It really is an important ministry. Here's the best way I can describe what's about to happen to you. Has anyone been in a ball pit recently? Of course not. You're not five years old, right? But I have children, <laughs> and therefore I have. Um, for me as an introvert, coming to a conference and being at a workshop like this sometimes can be like throwing me into a ball pit with a bunch of random strangers in public. Just really awkward and really uncomfortable. And I know conferences and workshops, you come to sit, to blend in, to learn, and you just want to be fed. You're the feeders in your communities, and I know that on those situations, you come to these things to, to be fed and to just sit and rest, and I get that and I respect that. And I know I may throw you into a situation today where I'll ask you to share with me. Why? Because I trust in your wisdom. I trust in what you've learned along the way. I am not an expert, and nor will I ever claim to be. So I hope today that we can join in some dialogue together so that I can learn from your expertise in your own respective ministries with your own respective communities so that we can grow together and to work together to grow saints. Does that sound fair? Awesome. So we're going to begin our day today in prayer. I think if we were to characterize the, the um, ministry style of our Holy Father, it would be characterized by these words uh, by the prophet Isaiah. Our Holy Father is just so very keen on welcome, and he really is. He's working so desperately hard to enlarge in the tent, to strengthen the poles, to create spaces of welcome and hospitality for young people within our community. And so when we're talking about um, empowerment and engagement for young people, I think we're talking about this. I think we're not trying to create new space. I don't think we're trying to change who we are. I think we're simply strengthening ourselves and enlarging our capacity to, to build bridges of welcome and invitation for young people. So let us join together in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Creator God, we give you glory and praise for this opportunity to come together in your name. We thank you for the gift of vitality, for the gift of promise, for the gift of hope that the young people of our, of our faith bring to who we are as church. Help us as we journey with them. Help us as they discern their vocations and their callings in life so that the body of Christ and the kingdom here on earth just grows and flourishes to become beautiful and radiant. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I thought it only fair to share with you a little bit about who I am. Wow. Um, a little bit about me. My name, once again, is Christina, and my primary vocation is as a wife. Uh, I'm married to my best friend in the whole wide world, Robert. We uh, have been doing youth ministry together since 2008. That's how we met. Tell young people, you want a spouse, go to church. You'll meet them there, I promise you. <laughs> promise you that. And he's stuck with me ever since. We've been married since October of 2013, and this year we celebrate five years of marriage and 10 years together as a couple working in ministry, and I think that that's our greatest gift in our marriage. <laughs> I clap whenever I see them, too. <laughs> we have two little Tasmanian devils, Nathaniel and Josephine. Nathaniel is three and Josie is one, and some very rare days look like this most often, including today. <laughs> my days look like this, but they are all gifts, and these tiny little humans have taught me more about God's providence 
and the presence of real and true saints among us and the virtues of patience and love that I could ever imagine. And they truly, my family truly is my world. In my free time, I'm a youth minister by heart. I'm proud to say that I don't feel like I've ever worked a single day in my whole entire adult life. I went straight out of university right into parish-based ministry and from there on school ministry and now this work. Serving God's holy church and learning from living saints around me has been a great gift that I do not take for granted. I, serve, I served as a parish-based youth minister for about six years in Hamilton and then in Brant before moving into high school chaplaincy for another five. While off on maternity leave, Bishop Crosby asked if I was, would be willing to help foster and support parish-based youth ministry in the diocese. And as you all know, when the bishop asks you to do something, you do it. <laughs> So here I am. It's been a great gift for me, a steep learning curve, but one that I'm happy to be on. The Office of Youth Ministry, which Nicole and I serve in, prayerfully supports parish-based youth ministry teams, high school chaplains, and pastors in discernment for pathways for comprehensive youth ministry in the diocese. We also get the opportunity to lead retreats, network with young adults in the diocese, and host annual events such as the Diocesan Youth Rally. We're heading into three weeks until this youth rally. One of our musicians is at the back, um, Kathleen LeBlanc, who's going to be a part of our worship team, and we're very blessed to host this wonderful day each and every year for young people in the diocese. In our spare time, we've begun a partnership as well in Rankin Inlet Nunavut, a youth engagement program which hopes to foster a very intentional and life-giving relationship with the Diocese of Churchill Hudson Bay. If any of you know Bishop Crockey, He's a wonderful, wonderful bishop who's ministering up in the most northern parts of our Canadian church. Please pray for us as we continue to grow this work. What have we learned through this work is that the youthful church is alive everywhere, and all of our hands are called to serve it. So before we begin, I want to hear from you. I think this is only fair. Um, before I share with you what I think that our young people need to feel empowered and engaged in ministry, I'd like to hear what you think. So, you can work with the people at your table, or you can get up and move around if that's what you feel like you need, but there's three questions that I have for you as we begin. What's one thing that you believe to be true about young people in today's world? Just in general. What's one thing that you believe to be true about young people and their encounters with our Holy Church? And what's one thing that you believe young people offer our church that absolutely no one else can? I'll give you a couple of minutes to dialogue, and then maybe we can have some group sharing. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about those questions. I hope you had fruitful conversation at your tables. Does anyone have a, a, an idea that they'd like to share with the larger group? Nicole is around with a microphone, so she'll walk around with that so no one has to use her teacher voice on me, I promise. Does anyone have something they'd like to share? Okay. I'm Sister Cora, Salishan's sister. So, uh, I say what I shared here. What is one thing you believe to be true about young people today? Well, I work with young people and our charism is youth ministry. Mm -hmm. So, they are very idealistic. Since they don't know the faith, <laughs> what they know is that they expect something from us. And uh, the second thing is that you believe their encounters with the church. They are also disappointed most of the time when we talk about the church. They become personal. Uh, this one is not doing well. This one. So they're easily disappointed and easily scandalized by the things they see and the things that people tell because they are not they are not founded well in faith. So they cannot reason. They they easily are discouraged. So they need a, they need input of the faith. The third is, what can they offer that no other else can? They can offer us technology. Mm. Yeah, and they are really good with that. And uh, yes, we can use them. <laughs> we can make use of their knowledge. And sometimes that's the, that's the entry point to win, to win them. If you tell, I need you for this, then, yeah. Amen. and then from there, you can work out to, to bring them back. That's, that's only one way. Thank you, sister. Anyone else have anything they'd like to share? It doesn't have to be on all three, just, yep. 
Hi, the uh, one that we were talking about was that um, we believe that uh, young people, uh, what they're looking for is for us to be really authentic. And the reason, uh, we, we were just using examples of, uh, like I remember five, six years ago, there was an argument between a priest and a parishioner, or maybe it was the priest and a bishop, I can't remember, and we were all like, okay, now we're not gonna tell our young people about it, because we wanna give them one more example of why they should leave the church, like, you know, Catholics behaving badly. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, people are looking for that, 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 that authentic. They know if you're not actually, if you're not being truthful about what's going on in the church and how you're solving the problems, that's what they're looking for. Um, one of the things we're discussing is uh, the same, same youth that used to follow like LifeSite News are now like, blocking it because they want to see more authentic things. They can, you're not getting just like one source anymore of your information. Um, so it used to be we used to get all of our information about the church through our parish. But now there's the internet. Mm -hmm. There's several news sources. There's every single person with one of these phones videotaping what's going on. They all have their interpretation. So it's the whole thing about trust that they really need to see that in us, I think, as church. Absolutely. Anything else? Maybe one more thought? Oh, two more thoughts. Yeah, we'll head over this way, sure. With regard, with regard to number one, well, first of all, my name is Friar Ed. Uh, I'm from Kingston. And so the first one is, um, uh, my impression is that they are open, very, very open, and inquisitive. Mm -hmm. And they're really just, you know, the, the, that the inquisitiveness is uh, part of what's gonna fall through is that in the process, they're discerning. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I think there was one more over here, Nicole. I'm Father Norm Tank, I'm a Brazilian father from Toronto, and um, my ministry, I have a couple of ministries, is I am the uh, formator for our pre-division young men in North America, and their college all over the United States and Canada. Um, having said that, I also work at St. Basil's Parish, mm -hmm. which is in the heart of the university, surrounded by government buildings, office buildings. In my experience of young people, it's a very complex group. We have students, we have people who have been married, who are married, have children, have already been divorced, mm -hmm. have been through a whole variety of things. So it's hard to pinpoint what, what exactly the issues are. We're really dealing with young people almost one at a time mm -hmm. uh, because of just the range and variety of their experiences. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One more. <laughs> the last one. Du moins, je suis le père Bautier du diocèse de Saint Jérôme. I can speak. Je ne parle pas bien anglais, donc je vais me débrouiller en français. En fait, je vais répondre à la troisième question. Qu'est-ce que les jeunes peuvent nous donner à l'Église Je dirais que c'est un questionnement constant. Il ne nous permet pas de rester sur nos habitudes. Constamment, ils vont nous questionner pour qu'on cherche plus et qu'on avance. Parce qu'avec les jeunes, ils vont toujours vous amener plus loin à chercher à découvrir l'authenticité. Ça va nous permettre toujours d'être une église jeune dans le sens où on ne s'habituera jamais au mystère qu'on célèbre. So I hope this opened up a little bit of dialogue for you um, about how you feel about young adult ministry. We all come in with our, with our um, history, our wisdom, our pre preconceived notions. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give us a holistic understanding of what we should all look like or what we should all be doing to empower young adults within our own respective communities because you know your community best. Each community has a flavor, a charism, each community has a pulse. But what I'm going to do today is give you a few little facts about who we are as ministers to youth, you know, what, what young people should expect when they come to us to engage in young adult ministry, as well as a little bit about what young people are saying about how they feel and what they expect from the church in terms of support and accompaniment. And that word is everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere, and it's, it's everywhere within my own presentation as well. 
So we have this beautiful little document that's been created by our Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, it's called You Give Them Something to Eat. You can find it online. If you don't already have a copy, it's fully accessible in PDF, and it was written by youth ministers for youth ministers within Canada. It's our new model for Canadian Catholic youth ministry. And in it, we hear two tasks. And I think at best that at the core of this presentation, we all start on common ground and talk about what youth ministry or young adult ministry is. There are two key tasks to consider when talking about ministry with young people. What do we owe young people? What should they be assured of when they walk into our parishes? Our university um, chaplaincy centers, maybe even a bar for theology on tap. What should they expect from us? And there's two pieces to this model. So the task of Canadian Catholic Youth Ministry is, first of all, we are called to give a, or to facilitate a life-giving and life-changing encounter between young people and Jesus. And we do this with love, mercy, and fidelity in the face of great change. And I think we talked about that. We talked about the technology. We talked about um, the misconceptions sometimes um, that we're hearing about our faith, you know, when media makes us look bad, you know. We, we hear this um, when young, young people are in influx all the time. And number two, we are charged with the task of helping young people know and reflect upon their own gifts, their talents, experiences, strengths, and weaknesses in the light of the good news, and commit to a life of discipleship. And I'd like to argue that there's a piece missing here. Um, and that piece is through a discerned vocation. So I'd like to see them commit to a life of discipleship through a discerned vocation, which is where all of you come in. And I think the vocation piece, or at least the vocational age, is what gets forgotten about. We're charged with the responsibility and the privilege to walk with young people throughout their entire lives. We accompany them unbiased of age, of gender, of orientation, vocation, or marital status. And I think Father was speaking to that earlier. We walk. We walk with them. Jesus did not discriminate, and neither should we. But there's a gap in the age... There's a gap in the reminder of the age of responsibility. We feel it very heavily, our responsibility to accompany young people up until the age of minority. Until the age of 18, we feel okay with talking to young people about their faith, and there's actually intentional environments for this work. We see sacramental formation. We see vacation Bible school. We see youth groups and parishes that thrive. And we invite them and their families into dialogue and active participation in the church. There's a home for this work. But then they cross the stage at graduation, at high school graduation, you can almost see it, and they're out the door quicker than we can hold it open for them, right? And here's the sad part sometimes is that we let them do that. Due to relocation, due to jobs, financial obligations, school, work, exploration of careers, due to relationships or over-relationships or lack of relationships, we let them. We disengage when they need us the most, and that sometimes falls on us. But the body of Christ is quickly realizing that we're missing that limb. And it's critical to regain its function and purpose both in society and in the health and the vitality of the church. And we folks are Easter people and joy is our song and it's time to greet the spring. It is Easter time for youth and young adult ministry. The fact that you're all in this room eager to learn and to dialogue about this is, is point and proof of that. There's much energy and enthusiasm um, and effort being made so that young people feel known, loved, and valued right now in the church. Our Holy Father is listening, and the Synod on Bish of Bishops happening in October is proof of that. And the pre-synodal dialogue is proof of that. The Canadian church is listening. The pre-synodal consultation that happened across our nation was vibrant and brilliant, and the responses that we're hearing back are powerful. Our brothers and sisters of other faiths are listening too, and we are now becoming somewhat of a template of, of how we engage in uh, consultation with young people for them as well. And here's the biggest win of all. Young people are feeling welcomed and empowered to advocate for their own needs. There's a revolution of empowerment that's happening in our church, and young adults are seeing faith as a necessity in their lives and making their voices heard. So here's the deal. When we're talking about what we're facing and the realities in our parishes, this is what we're looking at. In my day, it was this guy. Does anyone remember him? He was the bane of my existence. <laughs> 2012, Jefferson Bethke made a YouTube video called Why I Love Jesus and Hate the Church. It went viral in a matter of days. Today, it's at 1.6 million views on YouTube. I remember being a high school chaplain and like the greenest high school chaplain you've probably ever seen. And this video going live one evening and walking into my office the next day and there being a crowd of young people waiting to talk to me 
outside of my office door about this video. And they were saying, yes, I feel the same way that, that Jeff does. And yes, the church is to blame. And yes, I'm going to stand up and lead too. All because a guy could rap really well and looked really good in a sweater. Not exactly a foundational cause for Exodus, if you ask me. Today we see something a little plainer. A quiet, unsuspecting cancer which is emptying our pews and our hearts of the vibrant and, nece and necessary presence of young adults. We call it the silent exodus. They're leaving. For one reason or another, all valid and all tragic. But why I think they're leaving is because the primacy of Sunday is being lost. So when we're not being fed by our source and summit, our identity as Roman Catholic Christians is being traded for a more secular understanding of community. So with that said, all that we are and all that we can be is not being lived to its fullest because we're not open or receptive to receiving the great summons of the Lord. So we are satisfying ourselves with secular understandings of community and wholeness, much of which feels very empty and void and superficial at times. And we know that we're living in mission territory. We see fall away. We see young people more readily due to their own opinions or opinions and feelings of their families and familial pressure to fall away. The reality as it stands in 2008 was that per generation, we're losing approximately 10% of all fully initiated Catholics. And this reality impacts our ministry most critically because young people were meeting at coffee shops in our offices or university campuses or even our confessionals. They feel displaced. They know they're meant to belong and feel called, but they don't know how to begin again. And here, here's the sad reality. Many of them have journeyed through adolescenthood, teenage years, and now into young adulthood without the fullness of the faith. We see a beautiful, um, you know, uh, a beautiful example of this coming back to Christ. You know, we hear our resurrection story. We hear the good news story in one of our parishes um, in the Guelph area who received in nine this this past Easter Vigil, nine fully initiated Catholics back, who are all university age, who um, through the help of their campus minister, through the help of their chaplain, through the help of their university Newman Center, have come back um, and are fully initiated into the faith, which is beautiful. So with all this being said, I know this to be true in my bones that most often these young people may be leaving the church proper, they're leaving the physical structure, but they're not leaving the faith, they are not. Many feel excluded for one reason or another. Sometimes they have a hard time finding an ally and what they're thinking or feeling or experiencing. And I think we heard that earlier um, from one of our friends who was sharing at the back. And especially in their day-to-day -day that, that leads to an alienation of some sort. And we are hearing this in our own consultations. We'll be sharing with you a little bit of what we've heard from young adults within our own community, in our own listening exercises, and how they have reaffirmed that this reality is not only within their own local diocese, but we're seeing this across North America, and even finding commonalities with our experiences of church in other places in the world through the pre-synod. Rather than being one more shut door, I want to focus today on the hope. It's Easter, let's focus on the hope. On opening doors and nailing them open rather than shut. So that even if our young people don't darken the door for another 10 or 20 or 30 years, they know that when it comes to their family of faith that there's always a standing invitation of welcome. Engaging young adults is not so much about programs or policies, and I think we're talking about this more and more, it's about the human encounter of the church. An encounter, and more specifically, an invitational encounter from one human being journeying towards God to another. It's the road to Emmaus, just recognizing him in the breaking of the bread. So there is beautiful hope. In dialoguing with young people over this past year and with youth and young adult ministers, I know, I trust that the Spirit is moving. Young people, although they may not be able to name it yet, they desire for something greater. They're saying to themselves and to others, there's got to be something more than this. And our Holy Church is really stepping up, making new paths for accompaniment and organic supports to meet young people where they are at with patience and charity, and they sharing with them, in turn, the heart of the Lord. Stats Canada still proves that Catholicism is still the most widely practiced religion in all of Canada, and this is good news, and it's making up approximately 60% of the population, with 21% of all Catholics being between that 18 and 34 years of age. And they, those young people are identifying to at least a monthly commitment to worship. And I'd love to hear afterwards, come chat with me, what your diocese looks like. But in our diocese in Hamilton, we're seeing an influx and focus, energy, and resource being spent on parish-based youth and young adult ministry. 
And uh, this may seem like a small number, the 40 um, parishes actively engaged in youth ministry, but for us that, that's great influx. I've been working within youth ministry in the diocese for a long time, and this is, this is growth, and this is renewal, and even just this past week I sat in on a new hire again for the diocese um, for a youth and young adult minister. So we're seeing renewal and gift. And within our own pre-synodal consultation um, over the past year, we, we um, welcomed over a thousand voices to speak their truth about what, it, what it's like to journey as a young person in faith and in the world. And what we keep hearing are that young people are looking for ways to come home to us. They're just hoping that someone that they can trust will walk with them. So not only is there hope, but hope has a name, and hope has a name in these 300 beautiful, bright, vibrant faces who gave a week of their life together in Rome um, this past March, so the week leading up to Palm Sunday, at the invitation of the Holy Father and the Synod of Bishops to come together in a pre-synodal consultation. This was historic. This has never happened before. Young people have never been invited to come together to, di to dialogue about a synod about themselves before. And uh, this made sense. If we are going to speak together as, as, as um, a church um, and we're bringing together our Holy Fathers to talk about young people, it makes sense to have them present at the table. This was invitational. All walks of faith were um, involved. Not only was there Catholic representation, but representation from other faith denominations. One of our Canadian delegates is actually from a Cree community in Saskatchewan. This opened the door for new opportunities and avenues, especially for ministers out in parishes and in work in the community to serve young people. This was hope-filled and hope-driven. So 300 young people were represented by five continents, 20 language groups, including almost a dozen Facebook groups. And together, through hours and hours of work and prayer, they created a document, 13 pages, summarizing over 50 pages of group notes to encompass the experience of young adults across the world. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, please do. It's on synod2018.va. It's there in a multitude of languages, as well as the um, group notes now are available both in French and English. But out of their work, there were five big ideas that were presented about the challenges and opportunities for young people in the world today. And I think it's important, if we want to encounter and engage young adults, we need to know what their realities are and how the primacy of faith might fit into that mosaic. So these are the five that they talked about. So we're gonna go through them just a little bit together and hopefully it gives you some food for thought moving forward today. The first most important piece of who they are as young people journeying through faith is the formation of their personality. Young people are forming their personality and they're looking for community to do this in. They no longer desire isolation but real relationships with others. They brought up social exclusion as well as, as a huge barrier to relationships and learning more about who they are in the world. Young people identify that their personalities only come to true maturity in relationship with other people, and they named you as being those people to help them do that. They named youth ministers, they named educators, they named spiritual directors, they named friends as being allies and great supports. And that leads into their second point of relationships with other people being so very important. But they also um, made it very clear that sometimes it was hard to have life-giving relationships with others in light of faith, which makes the work that you do so very important. Your campus ministry centers, your discernment groups, anyone that you can gather with, your retreats, your, your, um, your weekend long retreats, those are so important for young people to come together with like-minded individuals who they can trust and talk about their faith openly, um, expecting real and honest answers. They also mentioned that the world is so very globalized and interreligious. And so the document actually says that the church needs to model and elaborate on theological guidelines for peaceful, constructive dialogue with people of other faith traditions. How do we speak truth in a way that's charitable? Many young people abandon faithful ethics to simply keep friendships. So young people are looking for allies to speak the language of faith. And we, as mentors, need formation on how to, how to teach them how to speak that truth in charity. They also talk a lot about their future, which is which just makes sense for young adults. Young adults want to be trusted in society. They desire that for themselves. They want to be listened to. It's very difficult for young adults to look towards their future and in it see a life lived in desire of holiness. Sainthood for many seems like something mystical and out of reach. 
That's why Pope Francis's new apostolic exhortation certainly is a game changer in this regard, bringing holiness into our day-to-day -day lives, reminding us of that, and reminding us to strive for that in a way that's practical and tangible. But young people need a reason to dream big. They need to be reminded that they can do this. And we, as their mentors, are called to be faithful cooperators in making the will of God alive through young adults. And I'm so glad that we talked about this already so much in, in this room. The relationship with technology was a big piece of, of what they mentioned in their document. Technology, although proven greatly beneficial for education and communication aids, has for many young people become a barrier to authentic and real relationship and communication skill. Nicole and I were just at a presentation at St. Jerome's University a couple of weeks ago, and in it, professors were saying that young people can no longer even get up in front of their class and give a presentation because they feel too much anxiety, too much distress in being in front of a group of like-minded individuals. They don't know how to communicate with them in person, but if they were to do that on Facebook Live or on YouTube, they could do it effortlessly. Some have even um, used the word addiction to talk about relationship and that it has somehow replaced human relationship and even relationship with God. We need to flip this on its head. Young people can no longer separate their behavior from offline and online environments. We need formation on how to lead digital lives as young people, one that protects and enforces human dignity. So how are we accessing these media forms as places of accompaniment as leaders in our communities? Our Lord ate with sinners. How do we pray with bloggers? It's food for thought. Searching for the meaning of life was obviously a, a big on their list. Young people have so much burden and pressure put on the day-to-day -day grind just to strive for success and survive, simple survival. Many have had no time um, and have lost trust in traditional and organized religion because it has a very different message than the secular world about success and truth. This is also met with attention, and I think we talked about this, from scandal and corruption through the human church. It is no longer the organizational institution that will bring our young people home, but the persons or the person who knows each and every one of them by name. Look at Pope Francis, what a perfect example. Even what he did for that young boy just a few days ago who asked about his father who had died. That brought so much healing for that young man and who knows how many other countless others around the world. That brought, brought gift and grace but that was the human church alive. It is through willing, receptive servant hearts just like yourselves that we will see the fire of evangelization and renewal grow. I have a quick video to show you, I'm sure you're sick of my voice by now too, that was made by some of the 300 delegates at the pre-synod in March. This is their thoughts and opinions, and they're much in alignment with the final thoughts of the document, but all in all, it really humanizes the reflection to see the faces and know the names of those that work tirelessly to, hear, to have their voices heard and known. These are the people who advocated for young adults all across the world. The common theme in my language group was when you have personal relationships with people that are vibrantly living their faith, then you yourself are inspired to live your faith. And so when you have a hard question and you have a relationship with somebody who loves Christ and you can go to them and say, this is my issue, this is my problem, this is my struggle, and they can speak truth into that situation and walk with the young person, whether they identify as homosexual or whether they think the, the church is oppressive to women, somebody can speak truth into that situation and they, they trust that person because of the relationship they have with them. I think a controversial issue I will talk about um, is pornography, and we talked about um, steps in where we can, as Catholics, can help better accompany um, young people in dealing with this, because it does have serious effects. We need more people working on this, and hopefully coming up with ways to better accompany people um, on this topic. Young people seem to live in this age of anxiety, um, me meaning that um, in a world of seemingly infinite possibilities, they're almost um, um, paralyzed because they have all of these uh, different options and they want to go forth, but they want to make the right decision. And I thought it was very comforting that the Holy Father um, uh, talked about this and he, he, he said that if we are afraid of failure, if we are afraid of uh, taking a risk and um, pursuing a path, then we become very old at the age of 20. If you have questions.
questions about these quote-unquote controversial issues, ask them. We are going to discuss them. It, they, uh, nothing is too radical, not, nothing is too uh, out of left field. Uh, a need and struggle for a, for a young person is, is good enough uh, to discuss. So at the end of the day, with the um, 50 pages of, of group notes and the 13 pages of the final document, here are the big three. If anyone watches This Is Us, you'll know the big three. But here are the big three ideas that come out of this document, and I think that they affect the entire church, the entire body of Christ. Number one, young people are looking for authentic witness. And this isn't just people who are charged with the idea of authentic witness. You know, we don't write that on a business card anywhere. You know, Rosie, who is 95 and sits in the front pew, who's been there since she was, you know, eight months old in her, in her church, she is called to be an authentic witness just as much as our pastor is, just as much as our youth minister is, just as much as our parent is. People who lead with vibrancy and joy, joy of the gospel, and are transparent and honest, and that means knowing our faith and knowing it well. The second is that young people are looking for mentors and they're not looking for this en masse. They're looking for someone, one person to walk with, to trust them, to talk to, to confide, to confide in. Real people striving for holiness. Just people living both within and without the noise of the world. Young people are looking for someone that they can grab a coffee with and just, and just pray with all on the same day. Young people want to be known, heard, and valued. They desire meaning for their lives. So if we were to put together a job description and apply here for the person who would accompany a young person along the way, this is what we would look like. And this is, these words are exactly directly out of the document from the precinct. And so young people writing this for themselves, they wrote this job description. Nicole and I joke that the next time we post a job for a youth minister, we're just going to post this and that be that and let the Lord send who he's going to send. Because you can't, you can't make this up. It's, uh, it's so, uh, beautiful and to the point and it encompasses everything that young people need so I, I apologize but I will read it to you because it's just so very beautiful and every time I hear it it strikes me for a different reason we need to find and this, these are young people saying this we need we desperately need to find attractive and that doesn't mean we're all going to the spa later they're looking for joyful attractive coherent and authentic models we need rational and critical explanations to complex issues. Simplistic answers do not suffice. We need a church that is welcoming and merciful, which appreciates its roots and which loves everyone, even those who are not following the perceived standards. We need inclusion, welcome, mercy and tenderness from the church, both as an institution and as a community of faith how to be the accompanier, how to journey. I think that, we, that when we talk about impactful young adult ministry, once again, I think that the emphasis is not on the programs then, but in the leadership. And young people are saying this for themselves. They're advocating for what they need. As a director of youth ministry, I deal much in ratios. Nicole and I are just in the throes of organizing the biggest event of our year where we gather all upwards of 600 young people on one little tiny site all day and try to keep all the humans alive and teach them about Jesus. That's, that's our job. And so we talk a lot about ratios. We talk about the one to 25. We talk about the one to 10. You know, if you're gonna have 10 young people, you need one adult. That's the way it goes. Rules, responsibilities, and liabilities. I think it's time that we flip the ratios on its head. When we talk about accompaniment for young people, and a director, another director from youth ministry told me this the other day, and it just stuck with me. It stayed in my heart, and so I know it to be true. We need to talk about the five to one. We need to say, here's our young person. Here's our Sally. She's 18. Who are the five people in our parish who are going to accompany her along the way? Who are the five people who are going to pray with her? Who are the five people who are going to check in, know how she's doing in school? know where she's applying to next year, know what pathway she might possibly be discerning for her vocation. We need to talk about it in those regards. Small group ministry. It's time that we build that village. With our Inuit communities up in the north, they talk about the circles, right? The circles of trust, the circles of support. 
in our Inuit communities, they place the young people right in the center and everyone else is on the outside. We need to get to that place as a church. We need to just embrace our young people and protect them and journey them outward that way. So I want you to tell it to me straight. You can tell me if I'm completely off the mark, if I've lost you, if you're asleep, <laughs> if you need a coffee. But I want to hear from you because I don't know your communities, right? If you're from Hamilton Diocese, I'm working on it. I'm trying really hard to get out and to meet everyone I can along the way. But I want to hear from you. And maybe you can dialogue with your, with your table one more time for me, again, about what you think the young people of your community need to thrive in early adulthood. Anything. Anything that might have come your way, crossed your desk, um, made it to your email inbox. And what do you think young people need in your community to thrive in their journey towards Christ and their discernment of vocation? Can I give you a couple more minutes to chat? I'd love to hear from you afterwards. Go for it. Okay, folks. We're gonna help Nicole get her steps in today. <laughs> She has the microphone again. Does anyone have something that they'd like to share with the larger group? It doesn't have to be about these questions, it's just if something struck you in the presentation. Um, we thought of um, what you just said, authentic witness. We just imagine this young man or woman who is growing towards early adulthood and so many changes in their bodies, so many changes in their relationships. And therefore they need somebody who can be authentic, say the truth, be authentic, and also somebody who can name it because there are some things that they would need to say and you don't have to say pray the rosary. You would have to talk the language of the youth to be able to understand where they are. Mm -hmm. You talked about the five to one, and that mirrors my life. At 74, I can't imagine how several women have found me walking oh. into our, our, our home, yeah. and all they want to do is sit in front of the fireplace, and I listen, oh, and I beautiful. listen, and I listen, and they go back. And I think that university kids, from your inspiration, need to know that there are people in the city who, when I go to university, Grandma will take me for supper once in a while, and so and so, yeah. just to know that they are not alone. Yeah. That's beautiful, thank you. Okay, well, I'll be at the back, and I'm happy to uh, discuss any of this further with you. Uh, I wanted to offer you some support and resource, and please offer me some as well. We're always looking to grow in our capacity um, to best serve our own diocese here in Hamilton. But some supports for you along the way. This is not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. Sister Nancy said, could you give me a one-page handout? And I thought, sure, here's 45 little helps and tools and resources, but I put also um, a bunch of good reads down in the, the bottom left hand corner there if you're looking for something um, to uh, widen the scope of your understanding of young adult ministry as well. Uh, some thoughts and ideas about young adult ministry and young adult communities as well as on that fact sheet and tips and tools to consider as you move forward. Nicole is at the back right now um, and as you leave you can learn a little bit more about what our office does and how we um, strive to promote comprehensive youth ministry within the diocese. So there's little pamphlets about what our office does each and every year. Our business cards are there. We've also created prayer cards for the synodal year. So taking the message that our Holy Father gave to Canadian youth 
this past October, we crafted a prayer for young people within the Diocese of Hamilton. So each and every one of our parishes was um, charged with the responsibility to pray for young people on Palm Sunday, this past Palm Sunday. And so they received these prayer cards at the parishes, schools, chaplaincy centers have them, high schools have them, um, school boards have them. We've seen whole school boards commit to praying for young people for the rest of the year. We've seen families who are doing this as well. Um, just really beautiful gift coming from these prayer cards. It's all the Holy Father's words, not ours. So please feel free to take one. And if you'd like to rework it so it doesn't say the Diocese of Hamilton, it can say the Diocese of Blank or the community of, um, to, to pray for young people, you're welcome to do so, Nicole. Okay. If you're looking for anything else as well, please do not hesitate to reach out and ask me. Grab my email, drop me a line, I'm happy to get you whatever you may need and support you in your work. Does anyone have any last questions? Yes? Um, I think that that's I think that that's in the works. Um, so Catholic News Service I know was on site for the pre synod. Um, I you know Salt and Light was as well. Uh, we're actually meeting with our friends over at Salt and Light on Friday, so I will ask that question for you, Sister. It should be put in bulletins. Yeah. So that we can, all the people can tune in to Salt and Light. Absolutely. I agree. Um, so I'll, I'll work with our little community here in Canada. We're, we're fortunate enough to um, know our, our delegate from Canada quite well and see if we can get some intentional um, publicity around that because I think it's so very important and that's why we wanted the prayer cards up there so that at least we can say when October comes, you know, we'd like to start a novena for youth leading up. Could you please join us? They already have a resource there, right? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you, which diocese are you from, sir? London. London, wonderful. Uh, so we shared those as well with our London counterpart, uh, Claire, so she has those as well. If there's anything that we can be doing to support that work, we would love to do that. Thank you. Okay, folks, drop, oh, I'm sorry, sister, yes. I don't know who posted them, but I've watched some of the sessions of that meeting on um, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's the first time ever <laughs> that our Holy Father has ever, or our, our church fathers have invited young people to join in that social media forum. There was upwards of 10,000, I think, comments across the world. So, you know, you know universally that there was 10,000 comments from Facebook groups. So that breaks down into the different language groups. I think the Canadian group was five five or six thousand participants uh, so they were given permission there were specific delegates just for social media um, forms to be able to post live yeah it's a pretty interesting way of doing it and from the rumor on the street is is that each bishop who is delegated to go to the synod in October is allowed to bring one youth delegate with them as well so it'll be interesting to see what that young person's task will be much of which I think will be you know, engaging in those forms. The world is watching. It's, it's an exciting time, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing how it unfolds. I am on social media, <laughs> so please reach out to me. Uh, you can follow what our office is doing if you are an Instagrammer or a Twitterer. I don't think any of those things are real, but um, follow us, and, uh, and we look forward to chatting with you afterwards. Thanks for having me.